uh, and actually this is an in-person talk, which is really super exciting uh, for us. It's a rare event, and he'll be with us, with us uh, the, whole, the whole day today. So um, yeah, Greg, thanks a lot. All right, well, yeah, thanks, Pete, for the introduction. And yeah, it's really nice to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, so today I want to talk to you about uh, reasoning in natural language and why I think text is specifically is a good vehicle for representing that. Um, OK, uh, so I'm going to start with the problem of textual entailment. So uh, I think this is a nice problem that encapsulates sort of what we mean when we talk about reasoning. So pre-trained transformer models can do a pretty good job of taking a premise like a dog is chasing a cat and then recognizing that a hypothesis like two animals are running uh, is entailed by that premise um, or two animals are sitting is contradicted by that premise. Um, so I would argue that this is an instance of what I'm going to call latent reasoning. Um, so if we probe these things a little bit, we can find some evidence of systematicity. Um, for example, if you say something is chasing, um, the model will pretty, you know, reasonably generalized to say that that thing is not running across many values of x. OK, um, but of course, there are failures here. Uh, so if you try this, this is on the Roberta MNLI, I think off of y'all's demo. Um, if you try three animals are running, uh, the model will incorrectly judge this to be entailed. Um, and it's hard to know kind of why this went wrong, right? Is it like because it's bad at numerical reasoning? Is it bad at this particular like pair of numbers or something? Um, and I think. Uh, my kind of favorite example of this kind of challenge, these challenges with diagnoses is, are the kind of stories around multi-hot question answering, um, where there were a number of papers back in 2019, um, one by my student Jifan, um, Sewan's paper, um, Yi Chen Jiang's paper, that all talk about how these systems that seem to be doing multi-hop reasoning are really just kind of doing single hop reasoning, or you can build single hop systems that do just as well on benchmark data sets. Um, so the only reason this is surprising is because we don't know what these models are doing because everything is latent. Okay, so there have been a number of proposals for how to make things better here, right? Like we improve our data, we use debiasing techniques, things like contrastive learning, um, et cetera. Again, like half the papers I'm referencing were like written here, so um, you all know this. Um, I'm going to argue, though, that this is kind of fundamentally barking up the wrong tree. So we have a question here from Natural Questions. What age do you need to be to buy a BB gun? And the answer labeled on Wikipedia is in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Ontario, British Columbia, and Quebec, the minimum age to purchase an airsoft gun is 18. Okay, so we could spit out 18 is the answer, or maybe the answer is some other number. Um, but if you look at this, there's a big problem, which is that it only applies to Canada. Um, so I'll give a plug for some work that I was not involved in, um, but uh, Michael Jong and Unsel from UT have this very nice paper at EMNLP um, called Situated QA, introducing a data set that incorporates these kind of extra linguistic context in uh, QA models. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, that's one issue here. And another is that, well, OK, we have airsoft gun in the context and BB gun in the question. Are these the same things? It's a little bit complicated. So. I would argue that no matter what number the QA model spits out, I want more justified reasoning before I'm going to go out and buy a gun and break the law. So if we kind of think about what that might look like, I'm going to contrast this approach with something like a theorem prover. We're going to go back to the entailment example here. And the way a theorem prover might do this would be we convert this whole thing into some kind of formal semantic representation. Uh, and then we say, can we basically prove the hypothesis from the premise? Can we use some kind of rules that allow us to derive a proof that goes from the uh, premise to the hypothesis? So this would be great if it worked well. We could articulate all these in intermediate reasoning states. Um, we're really good at doing search in these kind of theorem provers. They've been around for a long time. Um, but the problem is this requires a high coverage semantic formalism. And you need to be able to parse into that formalism accurately. And then you have all these rules that you can't learn from data. So there's just all these things that make this approach hard to work. Cool. All right. So here's what I'm going to kind of show as the goal that we're working towards in this talk. Um, we're going to try to do that same kind of reasoning with intermediate steps, but directly in natural language. Um, so we have a collection of evidence. We're going to derive some intermediate conclusions or kind of reshaped forms of that evidence. And then eventually we're going to get to some final 
form of that, and we're going to be able to assess whether that solves the kind of broad information need that we've got in this problem. And this framework is going to be applied across a couple different problems here. All right, and so the kind of key aspects of this approach are that uh, we are going to combine the sorts of logical inference that things like theorem provers are good at with the kind of lexical inference that pre-trained models have become really good at. And so I view this as kind of operating on a continuum where on the left here, we have uh, approaches like natural logic, which also uh, have been doing reasoning in natural language for a long time, but are much more ontologically grounded in things like lexical relationships and so have a hard time achieving broad coverage. And on the right here, we have the sort of new school of just throw everything into GPT-3, um, things like the kind of chain of thought model, uh, which was talked about in the Palm paper recently. Um, we'll talk, come back to that in about 15 minutes. Okay, so to kind of show what that entailment example would look like in natural language, um, it's very easy to write out the reasoning here. Um, text is a broad coverage semantic representation, so we're easily able to encapsulate this example. Um, it's uh, flexible. The you know we can take models that operate over text, like uh, pre-trained models, common sense knowledge bases. Wikipedia, all of these things are fundamentally in terms of text, so we can use them all for this. Um, and it gives us interpretable reasoning chains, right? It's easy for you to read this and understand what's going on. Um, the challenge is going to be kind of making this work soundly, getting the conclusions here to be justified and correct and not have it be just kind of made up stuff. So that's what we're gonna kind of talk about today are a few efforts that sort of try to apply this approach to some different uh, domains with some different models, and we're going to see how those work. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about a project on verifying the outputs of QA systems with NLI. Then we're going to look at this kind of longer horizon multi-step reasoning in natural language. We're going to look at whether GPT-3 can do it, and then we're going to look at uh, a kind of another approach um, based on some data that we've uh, constructed ourselves. Okay, so we're gonna start off with this QA verification project. Uh, this is work led by uh, my student Jifan Chen, uh, joint with Unsil as well, um, and appeared at EMLP findings last year. All right, so the idea behind this task is that we want to take a any kind of QA model that we want, I'm gonna call this a latent reasoning model, um, that returns an answer to a question. And what we're gonna to try to do is we're gonna to try to check this answer. Um, so if we have the question, who plays the bad guy in the good place, we can throw this into some kind of uh, retrieve and read model and get an answer, Ted Danson out. And then we're gonna look back at the evidence and say, was this really the answer? So why do this? Well, it can help us figure out if the question's unanswerable, um, it can improve confidence in the selective QA setting. Um, Amita's name is on the slide here. Um, and it can help us uh, validate presuppositions in the question. If the user asks something, but then the actual answer kind of disagrees with that, we can maybe highlight that to them. Okay, so here's the approach, which uh, kind of brings together some different pieces that I think constitute examples of this kind of reasoning in natural language. So we take the question and the hypothesized answer and we put them through a question to statement converter. Um, this is a T5 3 billion model trained on some data from Dora Dembski et al. Um, and it will, in this case, produce a statement that I'm going to suggestively call a hypothesis. Ted Danson plays the bad guy in the good place. Okay, then we're going to take the context and we're going to use a module here called decontextualization. So this was some work that Unsel did uh, during her year at Google where what they looked at was how to take a sentence in the context of say QA and reformulate it so that it can stand on its own. So a lot of this is basically an APRA resolution, managing ellipsis, things like that. Um, but in this case, it will replace the noun phrase, the series with the series, the good place. So now we know what series we're talking about. All right, so we do that to the sentence containing the answer. Now we have something that I'm going to call a premise. And um, voila, we can now dump this premise hypothesis pair into an NLI model and say, can you check that this hypothesis 
that was derived from the question and answer actually follows from the context. And in this case, the answer is no. The model's right for the right reasons, or sorry, right for the wrong reasons. Um, and even though it's giving the right answer, the context somehow doesn't justify that answer. So let me kind of uh, kind of outline again the system. So we have our QA system. It's any kind of QA system you want, latent reasoning. Um, we take the, that output, we put it into this verifier that brings together these three modules, decontextualization, the question conversion, and the NLI, and returns a competence value. So rather than getting uh, kind of hard judgments out, we're going to get competence values. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to use those to basically say, uh, rank all the kind of outputs, and then we can do things like only answer the questions we're most confident about. All right, so a kind of warm up experiment that we did was we trained a model on squad 1.1. So this model is going to answer every question that is given, and then we run it on data from squad two. So then it's only going to, uh, it's going to answer even the unanswerable questions, right? Um, and what we want to see is can our verifier help reject those bad answers? So if we use a Roberta MNLI model, it can do this at about 80% accuracy. It can reject about 80% of the unanswerables and accept about 80% of the answerables. Um, and what I want to emphasize is that this is zero shot. I mean, the, the term zero shot is very abused these days, but um, this NLI model did not see any QA data. Um, the question conversion model was trained on uh, squad data. Um, but basically, the kind of reasoning involved here mostly does not use this type of QA data, and the pipeline is not optimized end to end. We're using off the shelf components here. So the, the, I think this kind of shows the flexibility of the natural language representation and the fact that we're able to kind of form things into single sentence premises means that we can leverage these kind of off the shelf tools um, for this task. All right, so then the kind of main results we had here were in this selective QA setting where we uh, where we answer only the K percent of questions we're most confident about and evaluate performance at that threshold. Um, so for example, all the way on the left of the graph here, you see if we're answering only the 10 percent of questions that the model is most confident about, what accuracy does it give? Um, and this is in a cross-domain setting where we train a model on natural questions, and then we transfer it to four different out-of-domain data sets. So, in orange here is what happens if you just use the QA models posteriors themselves as confidence values, which is a pretty strong baseline for this uh, problem, actually. Um, and then our teal line here, um, which at the 10% performance uh, or at the 10% answer level goes from about 85 F1 with the baseline to around 90 F1. Um, our best model, which uses this, these QA po uh, posteriors in combination with this verification piece, is able to do quite a bit better. Um, and there's a little bit of extra sauce here where it uses both MNLI and also a converted form of natural questions uh, to kind of improve the NLI capabilities of the model. Um, everything here is still trained on natural questions, so it's still all kind of using the same training data. So I think the what's, what's actually most instructive about this, though, is to look at the errors and kind of analyze where this uh, works and where this doesn't work. Um, and one of the things that I think is really encouraging is that all of the natural language manipulation here is actually very reliable. Um, this question conversion and this decontextualization, like when you use big models, and this was just 3 billion, um, you know, we didn't do it with 11 billion, uh, it just works very well. So obviously most of the action is happening in the entailment piece. Um, and the interesting thing here is like the case that we saw before, we get some cases where the entailment model and the QA model disagree, and the entailment model is actually right. Um, so here's another one um, where the question was, who developed the central processing unit? The answer was John von Neumann. Um, so here's the reformulated version of it. Um, and here was the context that the model answered this from. Uh, so on June 30th, 1945, before ENIAC was made, mathematician John von Neumann distributed the paper entitled First Draft of a Report on the EDVAC. It was the outline of a stored program computer, blah, blah, blah. So again, there's a disagreement here between the NLI model and a QA model. The NLI model says this is not enough evidence to kind of conclude this statement here. 
Um, but the it's kind of labeled that way in the QA data set. So I think what this allows us to do is it allows us to kind of think about what is the evidentiary threshold to really answer something from the perspective of QA and does the evidence that we have really validate the answer? So what we've shown here is that we could do this kind of manipulation in natural language. Uh, this manipulation itself is highly reliable. And so it lets us kind of build this, uh, you know, small kind of reasoning chain just with a couple of operations involved. Um, but to try to bring the kind of question and the context a little bit closer together. Uh, and, you know, one thing we would really like to see in the future for this is be able to use some kind of explainable NLI model to kind of zero in even further on where the um, mistakes were made and also things like combining this with multi hop reasoning to deal with cases where the answer is really distributed across multiple pieces of context. Um, so I'm going to kind of touch on some of those ideas uh, in a little bit, but um, this kind of concludes the first part of the talk, the first thing I wanted to talk about. So I'll pause here um, and take any questions at this point. I can ask a question. Sure, yeah. I'm not so familiar with these uh, data sets, but for Squad 2.0, for example, uh, how does this compare to say, training on Squad 2.0 training data? Oh, yeah, it's, it's way worse. Um, I mean, the Squad 2.0 examples, I think, are very artificial. Um, I mean, they all involve these kind of substitutions, like a lot of them, like adjectives, like who invented the high pressure steam engine becomes who invented the low pressure steam engine. So, um, you know, of course, if you train on that kind of data, um, a model can like knock these out of the park. So this isn't pushing the state of the art. I think what it's doing is it's showing that we can transfer to this without having seen any of those examples. Um, and it kind of outlines a path for how to use this kind of reasoning across many different types of data sets, not just that style of unanswerable question. Yeah, good good question though. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I believe that MNLI data set has like very short uh, premises? Yes. Uh, you mentioned yeah. that now, like, you have single sentence premises, but I wasn't sure how you got there with the decontextualization. Like, those uh, still look like very large paragraphs to me. Um, yeah, so the, the right, it, <laughs> yeah, this is a long sentence. It is still just one sentence that contains the answer. Um, yeah, one of the things we would like to do that it's a, just a little bit hard to find data for are like, um, I mean, there's been a lot of work on kind of explaining multi hop reasoning again by like people in this room. Um, and uh, so I think you could imagine like taking pairs of sentences and doing the same thing. Um, at a certain point, you start to need different NLI models. And so we, uh, I think we had a brief mention here to this, uh, the like doc NLI model and uh, Anshuman Mishra stuff um, that, that kind of pull together longer context. So um, I think in general, what we need is stronger NLI so we can take in one sentence, big paragraph, multiple sentences, whatever, um, and still make the judgment. Um, but right now, like MNLI with, with you know, your favorite Deberta, Electra, whatever, actually just seems to be a pretty good uh, substitute for that. And it generalizes okay even to these longer contexts like we've been seeing. Uh, the other answer is that we did throw in this additional kind of NQ-based NLI data. Um, I think Dora did that in her stuff as well. Um, and yeah, that helps too. Thanks. All right, so let me move on then. So we're gonna kind of broaden our scope now. We've been looking at kind of this very regimented form of reasoning where we take, uh, you know, a kind of question and answer and a hypothesis and we kind of reform them with these single operations. What about sort of this idea of having larger collections of evidence and kind of deriving answers from them. I think in 2022, we need to ask ourselves, you know, does GPT-3 just do it? So this is a project that was led by my student, Shia, that uh, appeared on Archive on Monday. Um, so it's kind of hot off the presses, I guess. Um, and what we're kind of looking at here is we're shifting back to that goal at the beginning of the talk, like I said, and asking, can large language models already do this? Already take multiple pieces of evidence, build these intermediate conclusions, and just kind of solve your problem. Um, and so uh, it was already sort of invoked here, but uh, the kind of chain of thought style idea um, would suggest the answer is yes. So um, in their paper, they looked at, uh, in particular, math 
word problem solving um, is one of the tasks that they do very well on, where if you have the model generate an explanation of its reasoning, um, it can kind of work through the computation there and give a much better answer um, that's much more likely to be correct as a result of this kind of prompting. Um, and the Palm paper also has some examples of this. They have the kind of famous joke explaining stuff, but then also some nice QA examples um, like this one kind of explaining why uh, Shelly is going to be there in the Pacific Ocean because she's going to be in Seattle because of Pike Place Market. Um, and then Anna has this uh, few shot self-rationalization paper that also looks at, um, you know, basically free text explanations and the ability of GPT-3 to kind of reckon with these. So there's lots of work that's, uh, I think, kind of encouraging in this vein. So what we were looking at were, were two questions. The first is, does adding explanations to prompts improve accuracy for the kinds of reasoning tasks we're talking about here? And are the generated explanations reliable? Um, and I'm letting the word reliable do a lot of work here, and we'll come back to see what that means in a minute. OK, here was one of the tests that we formulated. Um, so it's a very simple multi-hop reasoning problem. Um, we have a number of basically SVO sentences, um, like Christopher agrees with Kevin. And then each person also has a profession, like Matthew is a plumber, plumber Danielle is a student, et cetera. Um, and the question is, who hangs out with a student? Um, the answer in this case is Mary. And there's this kind of two hop chain of reasoning um, because Mary hangs out with Danielle and Danielle is a student. Um, so it's a very kind of symmetric and controlled data setting, right? Everything here is kind of balanced where uh, we have two people who are hanging out with people. We have two students. Um, the kind of names and, and are balanced and everything. So there's no shortcuts that the model can take. OK, so how does how did the explanations come into play in these kind of, uh, you know, few shot uh, GPT-3 style in context learning models? So there's a couple of ways that we can do it. The first is just not use the explanations. This is the baseline. You just have the model output the answer. Um, then you have uh, the uh, what we're calling the predict explain uh, version of things, where you give the answer and then you give the explanation. Um, and this is sort of like how people, the original ESNLI paper does that task. They have this kind of multitasking layer where they generate the answer and then generate the explanation, but largely the explanation generation is kind of, uh, you know, does not really affect the answer, um, except through a few shared parameters there. Um, and then there's the explain predict method where you generate the explanation first because Mary hangs out with Danielle and Danielle is a student, the answer is Mary. And so now you can kind of condition on the explanation when giving the answer so the model can kind of see that. Um, and this is like how they do it in chain of thought. OK, so the full context that you would give to one of these models consists of your kind of concatenated training examples, right? So you have your training example, your label with your explanation, you have several of those, um, and then you have your test input, and you feed it all through GPT-3, and then you get your output and your explanation as well. So GPT-3 can always kind of follow the format that you give it, so it'll always generate something uh, that that kind of follows that template. Um, and so we're, what, what we looked at was using as many shots or, or training examples as possible in these prompts. So we weren't really interested in just like one shot or whatever. We kind of packed as much in there as we could. And for this kind of uh, synthetic multi-hop case, this was 16 examples in the prompts. OK, so we looked at this synthetic data set. We looked at a adversarial version of Hot Pot, which was kind of cooked up to be pretty hard. Um, and then we looked at ESNLI. And so our first question was, how does GPT-3 do with these tasks without explanations? Um, and we found that it didn't do great. Um, it was getting around 50% on the synthetic data set, where that was also the performance that a kind of surface level guessing baseline would give. Um, and on the other two data sets as well, if you have more data, you can train uh, kind of non-few shot models like Roberta to get much higher accuracy than we're seeing here. So then our hope was that explanations would really help. Um, and what we saw, was, which sort of surprised us, was that they didn't actually give much benefit. And it wasn't really consistent across tasks. 
Um, so the explain predict kind of chain of thought idea did a little bit better on adversarial hot pot around 5%, um, but it did worse on ESNLI. And then with predict and explain, we did see some improvement on ESNLI, but it did worse on adversarial hot pot and neither of them kind of cracked this synthetic case. So what kind of happens here? So when this is an example from the adversarial hot pot set. So we have the question, Crestfallen's artwork is done by a photographer of which nationality? Um, and the generated answer by the model is Crestfallen's artwork is done by Yelena Yemchuk. Yelena Yemchuk is a Croatian professional photographer. The answer is Croatian. This looks great. However, if you compare it to the actual context, she is a Ukrainian professional photographer. So the model has this kind of a devious ability to kind of cop, cut and paste these examples together in ways that are uh, not factual. Um, and we see this in the synthetic test as well, um, where the model will say, because Christopher helps Kelly and Kelly is a farmer, the answer is Christopher. Sounds great, except we said in the context that Kelly is a chef. So again, somewhat problematic here. Um, and so our answer to the second question is that the explanations are not always reliable. This is a failure of them to be factual with respect to the given facts in the context. So we evaluated this on both the synthetic data set and the adversarial hot plot data set. Um, and on the synthetic data set, basically whenever the model's wrong, it hallucinates its explanation. This is just very regular. It looks exactly like what we saw on that previous slide. Um, Hotpot is better, actually. Um, it still has around 20% non-factual explanations that it gives. Um, but there are some interesting cases where it actually hallucinates stuff that's correct. And part of this might be due to the fact that this is derived from Wikipedia. And the model seems to pick up a lot of knowledge from Wikipedia, likely due to the pre-training. Um, and the fact that some of these are kind of notable entities. Um, we also looked at the consistency of the explanations. Basically, does the explanation agree with the answer? Or does the model say something like, because the answer is Y, therefore the answer is Z? Um, and the sort of good news in some sense is that the explanations are typically consistent with the answer. However, I think we kind of should hold models to a high standard here. Um, I mean, I think this behavior that we're seeing where the explanations are factually incorrect is sort of one of the things cautioned about in the stochastic parrots paper um, that it can actually sort of deceive a user into believing an answer that's being given by the model, even if that answer is wrong. So we kind of did one more thing, which was rather than just predict this output and explanation and then get sad when the model makes a mistake, we said, OK, well, can we apply this idea of calibration or kind of selective prediction again? and use those explanations to figure out when the model is doing unsound reasoning. Um, so on the previous slide, I also showed the breakdown of correct and incorrect answers given based on things like factuality of the explanation. So if we can spot non-factual explanations, it looks like we can also spot where the model is making mistakes. Um, and so we did this with a fairly simple a uh, calibrator that post-processes the model's output probability um, by learning a very small number of parameters. This is a three-parameter model that takes both the original probability and also a single feature that's the lexical overlap of the provided explanation, the model's generated explanation, with the input context, um, and then also a bias term. And this, what this can do is it can take a small amount of additional labeled data, kind of learn to fine tune these probabilities. And then again, we set a threshold and we kind of reject answers that fall below a certain probability. Um, so I'm not going to kind of go into the results here. Um, you can look in the paper for that. This it it does uh, improve the uh, ability of the model to answer questions in this selective answering setting, um, but it's still not perfect. Um, and if you sort of like that idea, um, she also has an upcoming paper at ACL um, that learns a kind of larger number of features for V, um, not doing this with GPT-3, doing this with um, like Roberta models um, to do cross-domain QA and NLI calibration. Um, and these are features derived from feature attribution methods. So it's kind of looking at the mechanism that the model uses to answer the question and uh, trying to kind of derive some sort of meta reasoning from that, like reasoning about what the model is doing.
Okay, so to kind of wrap up this part, we see that the GPT-3 generated explanations are not always reliable. Um, and I think that this disagrees a little bit with some of the strong results in things like the chain of thought paper, um, but their kind of best results that they see are on these very programmatic tasks, like um, kind of math question answering, where there's kind of some explicit computation to be done. Um, when we're looking at these kind of multi-hop bridge style questions, that seems to be a little bit shakier at doing them. Um, and I will say that like, we still see what, in my opinion, is some really impressive stuff. Um, like having been looking at multi-hop reasoning since like 2018, um, I think it's really cool just the, when the explanations are right, what they can do. Um, but we were hoping to see a little bit more that the explanations would really ground the model's reasoning and we would see something very systematic. And instead it's a little bit more kind of write twice a day or write 23 times a day kind of thing, um, you know, but not, not always. Um, and then the, the final caveat I'll give is that I do think bigger models, I mean, it's possible that Palm just solves this stuff. Um, we've been playing around a little bit with the latest uh, Da Vinci models just this week, um, which do do better at this synthetic setting. They don't solve it, but they do about 15 to 20% better on both accuracy and also um, this factuality score. Um, we saw that, and we also saw that Hot Pot worked better than this synthetic setting, even though Hot Pot is like a little bit harder. And I think what all of this actually points to is that you need some kind of better supervision. The one thing we do know about these GPT instruct models is that they're all fine tuned on some human written answers to prompts. And so I think there's evidence here that if we inject additional supervision, additional kind of domain knowledge into these models, they will get better at this kind of stuff. Um, but just the kind of very raw form of the model doesn't necessarily do it. So I'm going to talk about some uh, some kind of paths forward there, but let me pause at the end of this section for questions. Yeah, I think the very interesting results, like the examples that you showed for um, explain predict versus predict explain, and make me wonder whether this assumption that if you predict after explanation, there will be this conditional answering. I'm not sure if that have a if one could explain the, these you know errors just by saying that in you know, a model. You know, figures out everything and then whichever order you ask it to answer, it just justifies the answer, even if it's stating the answer later, but yeah. it's made up its mind and it's the same thing, right? Yeah, um, I mean, actually, I, I want to I look at uh, Anna's paper a little bit more closely. We actually just saw that paper within the last like week and a half or so. Um, but I think one of the things that we see on ESNLI here is that the model in the explain predict setting kind of generates a slightly crazy explanation and then conditions on that. And it seems to do a little bit better, at least in what we found, to just kind of go right for the prediction. And then if the explanation goes off the rails, the prediction has kind of already happened. Um, I will note that the predict explain models, they still see explanations in the prompts. So there's still somehow this extra layer of supervision in the in-context learning. I don't really have a good mechanistic explanation for how that works or why, um, but it does obviously change things. It's not literally exactly the same numbers that come out. Yeah. Just... Um, so following up on your final point in the takeaway slide, um, I'm not very familiar with this train of thought line of work, but if you do not do this demonstration based uh, in context learning, but rather actually train the model, uh, on, on these data. I know you cannot actually train GPT-3, but hypothetically, if you could, oh, you can. not, with, yeah. not with these OBT models, um, what do you, do you think there will be a fundamental difference? Do you think we'll get better performance or will we see similar performance? Yeah, what I don't really know is I don't really know what the kind of training outlook looks like for training on like this small number of examples. Um, I mean, if for all these tasks, if you have like a thousand examples and you throw it into big language models, like it just like kills it basically. I mean, these these tasks, I mean, it's SNLI, like we've had good performance on that um, for like five years now. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think like absolutely training will help. I think the question is like, what are this kind of off the shelf capabilities of these models? And um, yeah, how do, and how do they kind of generalize to new settings that they're they're not trained on? I mean, I think that's what we were really looking at explanations to to solve for us. But um, yeah, I, I did I did talk to someone. I forget who who had played around with like fine tuning GPT three because you can do that in the API as well. And they they had a really rough time with it. Like they did not find good performance. So yeah, OPT maybe is the future. I don't know. We'll see. 
I'm trying hey, to get our, our Azure account set up. So. <laughs> Hey, Greg Tushar here. This might be a low-level question, but have you considered the order of uh, the advice or kind of the order of the chain of thought reasoning? Because it seems that the first statement in the explanation does not follow from the question. Um, yeah, so the, um, yeah, like the, I will say that the, the hot pot uh, case has kind of more varied explanations in it. Um, and that that might help. Um, I mean, uh, I think the the model, like from what we've seen in the hot pot, I've I've looked at the results there more because I mean they're just more varied. Um, the model does seem to be able to kind of so basically do two hops of reasoning internally and then just generate the second thing first. Um, for synthetic, I I actually I'm I'm not sure. I would have to ask Xi um, about that. But but that that's a great point. I mean, we did try several different prompts and several different formats for all this stuff, just because that that is something that this stuff is very sensitive to. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a really good question. Got it, thanks. Yeah. Hi, everyone on this slide. Can you comment on why the actual incorrect uh, is higher for adversarial compared to synthetic data set? Um, I think the, so basically the model will sometimes like say to, so, so, uh, one of the types of cases that shows up in hot pot is like who is older, person A or person B. And so sometimes the model will say like person A was born in 1945, person B was born in 1965, um, person B is older than person, and, and then therefore the answer is person B. So it's like actually the evidence is all factual, um, but the model just kind of fell down with that like numeric reasoning. For some reason, it just it doesn't seem to do well at those like age comparison questions, and there's like you know, at least like three or four in this, uh, you know, in this data set. Just briefly on this slide as well, did you use human judgments for these? Yes, metrics? yeah, yeah. Okay, um, let me move on to the last part of the talk. Um, so we've been talking about the kind of need for data um, and the need for maybe a more structured way of working through this kind of textual reasoning. So. Um, we're gonna talk about some work that we've been doing uh, on a problem called natural language deduction. So um, this is work led by Kai Bostrom, uh, joint with Lucy Zhao, Zane Sprague, um, and Swarat Chowdhury. Um, and yeah, I think I'm, I'm really gonna be preaching to the choir on this one because um, a lot of this kind of echoes some of the stuff that uh, the Aristo team has been doing here and we'll be using some of their data sets. So, um, but the kind of general framing that we're taking for this is that we want to have a pair of statements like apples belong to the tree fruits and the produce of fruit trees can be eaten. And we want models that can place distributions over the space of valid and useful conclusions. Um, so in this case, you could conclude apples are edible uh, from these two. Um, and the reason I say useful is because there's a lot of statements that are true, right? Um, you could just repeat one or the other of the premises, but these are somehow less useful. Um, so we would rather focus on cases that involve some kind of non-trivial inference in them. Um, so there's sort of two aspects of this I'm going to I'm going to touch on here. The first is how can we get data for this, right? So I mean I think if you kind of believe in the capabilities of these large pre-trained models, doing this kind of operation somehow seems possible um, if we have appropriate training data. And then how can we chain these inferences together and do multiple steps of reasoning, right? That same kind of thing we were looking at in the previous part. Okay, so we think about this kind of inference as blending two processes. This is kind of calling back to an idea from the introduction. So we have this sort of logical piece of this, like uh, things of X have property Z, things of Y are of type X, Therefore, things of Y have property Z. Um, so that's a very kind of abstract uh, logical inference that you can make that doesn't really depend on the lexical content of X, Y, and Z in some sense. Conversely, you also have lexical inferences. Like on the previous example, we went from can be eaten to are edible, right? And so this is the kind of thing that is really hard for systems like theorem provers to deal with, right? And any kind of formal semantic representation typically won't make it very easy to unify these two sort of concepts. Um, so what we're looking for in our data is we're going to be using sort of templatic data 
to get at these very regular logical patterns. And then we're going to lean on pre-trained language models and also paraphrasing to get at these lexical inferences. So the pipeline that we use to produce this data is going to be a semi-automatic pipeline that we can run at scale on Wikipedia. So the first step is we craft a set of first patterns. So this was really the sort of you know, clever engineering that Kai did to make this project work, where we have a pattern, plural nouns such as blank, do blank, essentially. I mean, this will match sentences like the fertile basin, such as the large syringe in basin, are an intensive use for growing fruits and vegetables. All right, so then if we uh, kind of apply some rules, we can rewrite that in this way. The fertile basins are an intensive use for growing fruits and vegetables. That's basically just a subset of the sentence that was given. The large syringe in basin is a fertile basin. So this relies on the Hurst pattern. This pattern X such as Y means that Y is of type X. Um, and then we can conclude from that, again, kind of automatically, that uh, things of Y are also in intensive use for growing fruits and vegetables, large syringe in basin in this case. Then we apply this paraphrasing to the source premises here. And the idea behind this is that we're going to change the wording and phrasing of these so the model can make these, these lexical inferences more strongly. Um, so in this case, we get growing fruits and vegetables requires a lot of fertile basins. The thuringian basin is fertile. So definitely a little bit shaky on that first sentence here. But as a kind of form of data augmentation to inoculate the model against kind of differences in phrasing, this actually works OK. So we trained a BART model on a bunch of examples we scraped from Wikipedia in this fashion. And if we don't do paraphrasing, the model will often just copy when it's presented with a pair like this. Doctors use medical tests to diagnose diseases and guide treatment. Some of the most common diagnostic procedures include blood counts and other multi-factor panels. The model's like, that can't really figure out how to unify these two sentences, so it just repeats the first one. Um, but with the full model and paraphrasing, it can correctly recognize that this diagnose frame and diagnostic procedures are a kind of point at which you can unify these two sentences. So we get doctors use blood counts and other multi-factor panels to diagnose diseases and guide treatment. Um, and here's another example. Humans changing an ecosystem usually has a negative impact, blah, blah, blah. Humans building homes in an ecosystem causes that ecosystem to change. So the model can kind of recognize that uh, building homes causes X means that then um, X will happen. Okay. so. Uh, what we did, and, and by the way, this is from uh, Kai's EMNLP21 paper. Um, we evaluated this on data from uh, Tushar's CASC data set, um, question answering through sentence uh, composition, where uh, we looked at the performance of in-domain trained models as well as ours, and we evaluated whether the inferences that the model produced were valid, had minor errors, um, were just repeats, or had big problems. Um, and the encouraging things we see here is that our model performs about as well as the models trained within domain data here. Um, and when the model fails, it usually repeats itself, which is something that's going to be very nice when we chain these together into, into multiple steps, because repeating yourself isn't wrong. It's just kind of vacuous, right? Um, so once we start iterating here, that's the failure mode that we're going to want to see. OK, so that brings us to the idea that we've kind of had the whole time here, which is be able to take these pieces of evidence and kind of chain them together um, in multiple steps. Um, and so we want to be able to dynamically apply these kind of deduction operations to get the conclusions uh, that we need here. Um, and the thing that I think is really cool about this problem is it is a search problem where the search space is basically natural language strings, right? Um, or true natural language strings, if you want to think about it that way. But even so, there's a very large space, and we have to figure out how to explore it using this deduction model. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a collection of evidence. Um, this is from uh, the Entailment Bank data set, uh, and a hypothesis. And what we want to do is we want to prove the hypothesis deductively from the evidence. So we don't just want to kind of classify it as true or false, but we also want to build the proof. <laughs> so 
our third, our kind of operation here fundamentally is about taking a pair of sentences and combining them. So what we're going to do is we are going to have a search frontier which consists of pairs of sentences. And then we're going to rank them using a heuristic that's going to allow us to prioritize which pairs to combine first. Um, and so some pairs are better than others. For example, if paper is recyclable and recyclable, you know, we give the definition of it, we can meaningfully make an inference out of those two, whereas uh, the second and third here kind of don't really uh, relate to each other and so can't really provide an inference. Um, so we use a heuristic that's trained on entailment bank that basically allows us to prioritize which pairs of sentences to try combining first. Um, and I think the key thing about this approach is that the search and the deduction itself are decoupled. So that BART model from before, which takes two sentences and combines them together, that's still fixed to what it was. Um, but now we have a model that looks at the hypothesis and guides that search. Um, and and these are these are kind of these concerns are separated among these two models. So what we hope to see is that the model will pick up a pair of sentences, generate a correct conclusion, um, you know, throw that back into the set of sentences, you know, generate another correct conclusion, um, and then eventually we'll be able to use an NLI model to say, okay, we've got something that's kind of close enough. We've proven our uh, goal here. So. This is the kind of search procedures. We iteratively produce these new set sentences. If we produce a repeat, it just goes away and, and we kind of move on. All right, so uh, we evaluated on the entailment bank data set, looking at the distractor setting where we have premises and a whole bunch of distractors. Um, and we want to prove true statements and avoid proving false statements. Um, and one of the baselines we look at basically looks at throwing the premises and the hypothesis all into T5 and then enumerating a proof tree. And one of the things we hope to see is whether the probabilities of that proof tree, the probability assigned by T5, really correspond to a likelihood of that proof or not. So what we're going to look at here um, is how often we prove the true goals. Um, so that's basically a recall on the x-axis here, and then the precision of what we're able to prove, which is on the y-axis. So we want everything to be kind of, uh, you know, up and to the right on this graph. So this, when we rank things just based on the proof likelihood assigned by T5, that likelihood is really not a good indicator of whether it's a proof or not. When we use a discriminatively trained T5 model, it can do it perfectly because the distract the the kind of fake proof the fake hypotheses we have here are kind of typically unrelated to at least some of the premises, and so um, you know there's the the model kind of can correctly spot that this is the distractor, um, but that procedure isn't necessarily tied to a constructed proof. So um, what we're trying to do is build the proofs that are actually reliable. And so to do that, we can also investigate the validity of the individual proof steps. Um, and so uh, what we looked at was kind of a human evaluation of how good each step of the proof was. Um, generative T5 kind of often had steps in there that were a little bit shaky. Um, and then adding more data, um, including the data from uh, Kai's EMNLP paper, um, helped more. Um, and just to kind of show an error case, like what happens in the remaining 24%, um, this is an example of something generated by our system. As the amount of oxygen exposed to a fire increases, the fire will burn longer. If something is left out in the open, then that something is exposed to oxygen. The fire will burn longer when that something is left out in the open. So I think this is a really interesting example because uh, if you're a kind of language model apologist, you might think, well, okay, you know, that something clearly refers to the burning thing, and so that seems fine. I think if you're a skeptic, you say, okay, well, the model's kind of just pushing around these tokens. This is totally ungrounded in any actual co-reference between these entities. Um, where's the truth? It's a little bit hard to know, right? Um, I think uh, I'll kind of come back to that in a second, but, um, you know, the idea that we want to get at here is to be able to do this kind of proof 
without having a ton of supervision. Um, and the kind of way that we structured all the reasoning here helps. Um, so to the point that we just had about the fire burning longer, one of the things we're looking at is trying to take a step a little bit more towards a symbolic reasoning version of this model um, that ideally can do things like uh, co-reference and have sort of stronger notions of what the entities are. Um, and another thing we're, we're kind of looking into is how to infer missing premises. Like if you have a collection of stuff that's almost sufficient, but kind of missing one key thing, what can you do there? Um, so I'll just kind of wrap up here and then uh, take any questions you all have. Um, a couple of just like goals we would like to, to see this kind of natural language reasoning be able to do. A lot of what we've been looking at here is on these kind of benchmark data sets a little bit abstract. Um, one of the things we'd really like to be able to do is fact checking. Um, so there's a lot of kind of complex political claims. Um, there's been some work and we have some work in preparation um, looking at decomposing claims into kind of sets of questions. And then, uh, you know, this is the part that's not done yet, but being able to take information about each of those sub questions and kind of combine them together to, um, you know, essentially build a little like PolitiFact article that tells you why something is or isn't true. Um, that's one kind of broad goal. Um, and another is kind of thinking about entities. So this is a line of work um, by my student Yasu um, and also Michael Jong and Unsel, um, thinking about reasoning about entities. So um, we have a data set paper from NURBS last year um, about these binary claims that involve both entity knowledge and also common sense knowledge. Um, and an upcoming uh, NACL findings paper about a uh, kind of closed style task where you mask spans surrounding entities and then test whether models kind of know the right things about those entities in order to fill in those spans with good likelihood. Um, and also whether you can do things like uh, patch in knowledge about new entities to improve how you guess those spans uh, further. Um, and just one other shout out, there is some nice work by uh, Uri Katz and co-authors um, looking at how to materialize reasoning um, for these kind of entity-centric tasks. So um, that's a sort of really cool direction, I think. Okay, so what I've talked about here is thinking about how to deal with complex reasoning problems in natural language. And so uh, we've seen kind of how many different things natural language can do, but then also there are some pitfalls. We have to be very careful about how we set up these models, how we formulate it, how we evaluate it. Um, but I think as we see bigger and bigger models, this is increasingly looking like the way to go. Um, these models just have great capabilities in this regard and are able to do really amazing things. So um, I really look forward to seeing what we can do with them in the future. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank all my co-authors on all this work and everyone else at UT, um, as well as my funding sources. Thank you. Ask yeah. Any question uh, for the last part of the talk mm -hmm. uh, where you're trying to create proofs? Uh, have you tried using the technique that you mentioned in the very beginning of the talk of like generate and then you know have another pop the shelf thing to validate or, or discard? Um, yeah, no, I mean, obviously, that's something that uh, <laughs> I mean, in the Aristo work, we, we've we've kind of seen and 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 Pete came and talked about that at UT and uh, in December. Um, we haven't really, so we haven't been looking at separate, at having the kind of separate discriminator yet. One thing we've been looking at is whether GPT-3 can kind of do this or at least rank the sort of reasonableness of statements. So um, yeah, we can definitely talk more about that because it's it's uh, it's one component that's kind of missing here a little bit, I think. Yeah. Your, your, um... NLI uh, components to check whether you're at the goal. Mm -hmm. I guess there's a, there's a uh, trade-off there about how powerful you make it. So if you make it too powerful, it'll just say, oh, you've met the goal already from your input. Yes. If you make it too weak, you're going to be searching forever trying to find something that's super close to the goal. Yeah, so we did, um, we optimized for precision rather than recall. Um, so there's discussion of this in the paper. I'm um, actually, we used, I, I should put this in the slides. We use, uh, W-A-N-L-I, I guess, uh, Alyssa's thing. Um, so uh, we use that, and then we actually 
um, we annotate a small amount of kind of in data in this domain um, and then tune for precision. So, um, but yeah, like we, we absolutely don't want to just be like, oh, you dumped a bunch of raw evidence. Looks great, you know, because then that subverts the entire thing. So, um, you know, I think all of this, like everything I've talked about here is really kind of backed by a lot of like us staring at Google Sheets and trying to validate whether these individual components work. And I think that's really the only way to kind of do things for these problems is you have to kind of have like you can have automatic proxy metrics, but you have to really check that all of them line up with with what you want. And so, um, yeah, I don't write code. All I do is annotate examples in Google Sheets and then <laughs> complain about mistakes that we find. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, really great talk. Can I? I don't know if there was a question from the room, but um, could could we go back to the uh, mistake about oxygen um, and being left out and fire situation? Yeah. Um, could you comment a little bit more on like what's the nature of this error? Is it that if A then B? is used inversely or uh, there's something else going on? So I, th I think the issue is really that like, um, there's a kind of, so the, in the first sentence as the amount of oxygen exposed to a fire increases, the fire will burn longer. If something is left out in the open then that something is exposed to oxygen, there's kind of this implicit, like there is a thing that is on fire and that thing is being left out in the open. Um, and, I think the model is kind of failing to unify that like the fire kind of substitutes for both the something is left out in the open and then it's also the same that something that's being exposed to oxygen. Um, so I think it's it's really that like the model kind of slot filled incompletely. Um, and sometimes that would be okay. Uh, the fire will burn longer when it is left out in the open would probably seem just fine to us. Um, but the fact that it says that's something, it sounds like it's kind of a, uh, I don't know, it's just the, the sort of specific phrasing of this, I think, sounds weird to us. Um, but but yeah, it's really this kind of incomplete substitution, I would call it. Um, okay. Interesting. These are really fun examples. Yeah, I think I think it's it's interesting to kind of see, see where things break down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anna, yeah. When we do more real world tasks such as claim verification, what are the key differences between this uh, multi step deduction and something like abstractive summarization? Um, yeah, I mean, so the claim verification stuff is like, like this is like a 20 year like <laughs> project, I think. I mean, so there's so many reasons that kind of real world claim verification is hard. Um, like one reason is just lack of access to the information like a lot of times you need to look up a statistic that the bureau of labor released in 2019 and you just have like there's no way to get that with any ir system or whatever so i mean you need human in the loop um, and then also the kinds of things that you need to ask here are very subtle so um this paper that uh we have in preparation led by jifan is all about how you try to kind of identify that if there's a statement about some uh, kind of political statistics, some, you know, some statistics related to labor, for example, you might need to ask, like, you know, are those statistics reliable? How did those compare to this time last year? Like, that's the kind of thing that fact checkers do um, that's really tough. So I think just the nature of the reasoning that needs to be done, it has this very strategy QA-ish flavor to it, where, like, you don't know why, you, you don't know exactly what you need to kind of pull out in order to do it. Um, and then the kind of complexities of real world political data just kind of turn that up to 11. So, I mean, fundamentally the approaches we're thinking about are human in the loop. Um, but uh, yeah, again, this is early stage. Um, it'll be going on for at least a few years and probably 20 if all goes well. So. <laughs> All right, we're at the time. So I think we'll stop at this point. So let's uh, give Greg a round of applause again. Thank you.